All right. Are we a bus? Out of here. We're a bus. We gotta go. We gotta get some good cigars, and we gotta get some good Keontae. And then we gotta meet Ross. We gotta go get some fucking meat and barbecue. I'm gonna get fucked up today. Oh. What time is it? Ten in the morning? Yeah. You ready to rock? I'm fucking ready to rock, bitch. <laughs> Five foot seven rumbled my ass. <laughs> Grab a couple of those Perriers. I'm going sober. I'm fucking wasted. <laughs> it wasn't a matter of more than maybe five or six months before I started really meeting people around the town. And uh, Berkeley happened to be one of them. I mean, the first one I met, obviously, was, was Evan, who uh, predominantly wrote the first record with me. Through Evan, all these other people started coming in. And before you know it, you start saying, well, you play bass, you play drums, you play guitar. Like, let's go jam. And that's how it started. Him and Evan had come to a show trying to find band members to start Death Ride with. So uh, I made myself available. I started on guitar in that band for I can't even remember how long. And then uh, we couldn't really find a drummer. So I said, I'll play drums until we find a better drummer. And that never happened. Our old band that we were in came to an end, and there was a spot for a guitarist. So I joined the band. You know, when you're in a room and you're jamming and you're having a good time again with music, you, you can make the change really quickly, abruptly. You know, even if it's big or you just released a record, which, which we did, my previous band, you know. <laughs> what the song is going to be right about now, right? Let's go from the beginning to the end of that 16 bars, and then everybody speak up and what they feel one at a time. Look what we've done in 20 minutes. Yeah. Communication. And uh, Monty Connor flew out to Santa Barbara. I said, hey, I got this band Death Ride, and we're jamming. We've got, you know, maybe seven or eight tunes. Come check it out. Monty came out, sat in a chair, like, right in front of us, like, literally a foot in front of us. So basically, all it took, once we had the songs that we considered, you know, to be our demo, sent them over, and uh, Monty Connor and Kevin Estrada came right over, watched this jam, and they said, okay, we'll give you guys a shot. And then for the next couple months, we basically finalized the album. And as people joined, it happened organically, totally organically. Diamond Joe Quimby doesn't take taxes. Whoa, whoa. this ain't Punch and Judy, motherfucker. Hey. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Go, Bob, you can do it. Bobby, what are you doing? Tell someone what they're not doing. <laughs> Look at motherfuckers. <laughs> hey, John, watch this. Right? What time is it now? Bing. Three o'clock. See you guys at eight o'clock for a shitload of fucking drinks, and you guys will be done. I'm going in. Bye now. Really hung over. Two more songs, and then you got one more day of two more songs. Let's do it, man. Believe me, Bob. Where are you going to put him? He's going to be chilling right next to me, checking out my feet. He's going to watch your shit. Did you start tracking yet, Bob? No. Give me a smile. Okay. I'm going to drink all your gym. Finally, we stepped into pre-production. You know, it was just two weeks of uh, five dudes. We probably had about six songs short, maybe five songs short. There was a bunch of songs that were written before I even joined the band, and then Evan and I and John Berklin had put together music for the rest of the record. Everything new is killer, you know? I mean, everything in life, no matter what it is, gets jaded. And, and at that point, there was no, no jaded. It was just, you know, a bunch of guys loving what they did and, and going in and, and jamming in this place that, was beautiful. We had our own world in there. We created our own world. And Ross Hogarth 
really put it together. I mean, you can hear, like, I Could Care Less on the first record, which we play every set, was really helped along by Ross, and he helped all of us to kind of integrate our parts and find ourselves. It was throw and go with not much looking back. A little sea salt. Mm -hmm. When you're Italian, you gotta know how to cook. You gotta know how to fight. You gotta know how to make love. And then in the end, you realize it's all one and the same. <laughs> to all my friends. May they be there in the end. The two ones were the I'd rather be carried by six than judged by 12. Death Red had a stand-up bass, because I was like, heavy metal with a stand-up bass. You know, I'm, I love psychobilly. I love all kinds of music. I listen to everything, from the blues to black metal. So we're in, we're recording the first record. Our stand-up bass player, Shaq, who's a great guy, a good player, but couldn't keep up with the music on stand-up. And I just remember being hammered, like, looking up at the sky, just like, oh, please, Miller. <laughs> I need you in this band. And Berkland said, man, my friend Miller is, is killer on bass. And, Miller just happened to be in L.A., so the transition was just... I was actually at a Lamb of God show, and I got a phone call saying that all of Shaq's bass tracks have to be cut because the stand-up bass just was not working for the project. It's pretty cool because John Berglund and I and John Miller have played together in a band since we were 15, so it was kind of meant to be in a way. Yeah, I slept in my car at the Sportsman's Lodge uh, the night before. And uh, I, I, I woke up, actually my pants were down, and <laughs> I don't know why. I guess he was sleeping in his car at the time and said, you know, we're going to bring him in. And I said, just bring him in, because we had already been in like two weeks uh, trying to get stand-up on this thing, and it wasn't working. And of course, studio times and budgets and everything else. So eventually, Shaq fell to the wayside and, and enter Miller. I went down to Rumbo and started learning the songs on the spot with, with Ross. There always seemed to be a strong force with the band in terms of what we wanted and, and uh, what Des wanted, and it's just so lucky to even be in a band with two dudes, Jeff and Miller, that I've been friends with since I was 14. I love that name. God, I loved it. I mean, you know, I had a vest with Death Ride on it and everything. I loved it. Uh, the label found a bunch of different things. You know, there was, there was everything from a, a bicycle race called the Death Ride to all these other reasons. And they said, look, we're not going to go fight all these people for their names to so come up with something different. I was at Evan's house with Berkland. We were all trying to think of new band names. And Des kept calling us and saying, how about this? How about this? My wife was going through uh, an Italian witchcraft book by Raven Grimassi, Strigeria, and I uh, found it found Devil Driver and, and the meaning of it, it just fit perfect. And the meaning of Devil Driver, if you don't know by now, is the witches call their bells Devil Drivers to ring away evil, to clear up any misconceptions. <laughs> I don't know who's gonna go on stage after us. They're gonna have a hard time. And I'm gonna make sure they have a hard time. Look at that. It was the best we could do at that time, and uh, my thoughts on it, yeah, it feels like just a band that just did what they did in, in that short period of time and didn't look back. In hindsight, I mean, it was very linear. Not a lot of solos and not a lot of technical, but it brought groove and it brought something different, I think. Some of Dez's coolest performances came out. I mean, he had a lot to, to prove to people. I think he had some of the most demonic, gnarly, Highs and lows, and when you listen to Dez, it's, you know, he, he's ultra brutal. I think at the time, um, the album's good. I think it's very basic compared to what we can do now, but you know, every record in this band's history has its own special place. Jeffrey Kendrick. Out of everyone in the band, the first one that I met, I met him first year in Santa Barbara. Jeff was in a band at the time, and I asked him if they wanted a second guitar player, and he said no. <laughs> and then, funny enough, about two years later, I ended up joining that band anyway. I've known him since 85. I met him in nursery school. We literally walked up to each other, and we were like, do you want to be best friends? And we were like, yep. <laughs> Jeff, will you let me get this on film? You're wrong. Please. Uh, my knee is the only thing stopping this door from closing. Well, I can do anything, so. Can I film it then? 
You like finger I was in your bed. Tell me going to bed. You want some mealworms and egg yolk? Nope. Pubic hair omelet? Nope. Please, Pete, the battery's gonna die. <laughs> this corn's biggest fan right here. It's, fan. it's a good luck Dude, charm. These are keeps it. New Balance running shoes. I run faster with the corn. How long is that? Like, how long have you? It's a hundred dollar upgrade. Really? Dude, it makes you play better. Yeah. You're yeah. sponsored by it, right? Yeah, sponsored by not New Balance, but by that piece of corn. <laughs> Jeff's just a solid rhythm player. He kind of comes up with a lot of the salt and pepper of a lot of the songs. Like, you know, the little part in I Could Care Less or and stuff like that, like without that stuff, like it wouldn't be what it is. He's a hard worker, man. He's a really hard worker. If I come up with a cool rhythm, his, his talent seems to line right in the jingle that's above it. But he kind of likes to listen to what we have and add to it. He's really good at that. A lot of the stuff that he writes, um, he comes up with on the spot. I just ripped off the coming right now. Perfect. You just quit. Your interview that you take. It would have been like right here. I, know, like, I would have like fallen over. That would have sucked. <laughs> I would have sucked. Jeff is a very worrisome man. He's always nervous. Jeff always needs something to worry about. I don't think he can function properly unless he's worrying about something. You'll always see Jeff in the parking lot on his cell phone, walking around in circles. I think that's what fuels Jeff stress and being worried about stuff, but that's what makes him a pitching guitar player. I think we probably put a little bit too much pressure on Jeff sometimes in that aspect, but it's definitely a rough room. The five of us and our crew are all together. If you do something stupid, you're going to hear about it for a long time. Actually, no, we're not going to do that, but I'm out of it. I want to make yeah, stupid jokes right now. Yeah. I don't think it's going to work out. I don't think a microphone works. I don't think this, I don't think this DVD or band's going to work out. Personally.